Welcome to today's event. I am Miriam Johnson. I'm a senior lecturer in publishing at Oxford Brooks. And today we have with us Ari, who is the CMXRO, <laughs> making that up, of Change, Please. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Um, thank you. So I thought just to, just to kick off things, I might just do a couple of slides and a couple of films just to give you a bit of a flavor to uh, who Change Please is. Um, so my name's Ari, uh, I'm the CMO of uh, Change Please, been here for two years. Um, it was started by uh, actually uh, now a friend of mine, um, Jamal Ezel, who was, who was the founder. Um, and before I show you the film to give you uh, the context of the brand, um, it's quite an interesting story because Jamal was actually working as a commodity trader with um, sort of gold and diamonds and making um, you know a decent living in life. Um, and uh, one day went to Vietnam on a trip, basically uh, attended a, um, a tea company, which was being run by um, a deaf and mute um, women who'd, been, who'd gone through also other hardships like abuse, um, including sexual abuse. And they were making the tea, packaging it themselves. Anyone attending wasn't allowed to speak um, in terms of the interaction. And he found that quite a moving experience. And as he was taking the bus back from that, uh, Tea estate, he sat next to a man who was asking him, what do you do? And he said, oh, you know, I do commodity trading. And hopefully there's no commodity traders on this um, on this phone call, uh, video call, sorry. But, um, and he was like, look, when you're 90 and you're sitting on a rocking chair outside your house, do you think you'll be able to be proud and look back at what you've done in life? And Jamal um, immediately felt uh, the impact of that statement. Um, so when he got back to Heathrow, um, he, he, he bizarrely was coming outside uh, driving in the car and saw a man um, on the street corner with a sign saying change please uh, and the rest is, is history he he quit his job he bought a van uh, like a little coffee cart uh, managed to convince Covent Garden to set it up for him um, uh, and and uh, the first two uh, baristas we had were big issue sellers a couple who come from Hungary um, and the great that was about seven years ago and the great thing is they still work with us so if you're even Canary Wharf um, and you see one of our vans, um, they're both there, uh, which is Marion and Lucy, uh, and they're, they're incredible. They never want to leave, uh, which is just a testament to what Jamal and, and the team have done. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you this video now, if that's okay, Miriam, and it's just a couple of minutes, but it'll just give you a bit of a, um, a starting point. There are many problems in the world that feel almost impossible to solve, but homelessness is not one of them. Even though it is an issue faced by all major cities in the world, Change Please provides a solution different to that offered by governments by delivering an employment first model. We are a life changing organisation where 100% of Change Please profits from selling our coffee supports people experiencing homelessness with a living wage job in the coffee industry, housing in just 10 days, training, mental health therapy, and a fresh shot at life. And we've proven this works with an 82% success rate. We launched with a single cart in Covent Garden in London, and we have grown across the UK and internationally into a total of eight countries. We now supply coffee to banks, law firms, hospitals, gyms, supermarkets, universities, train networks, airlines, and we will soon be in space. All while serving our five-time Great Taste award-winning coffees. This is not just coffee. This is life-changing coffee. They've done more for me in a year and a half than the whole government has done in 12 and a half years. The step is turned out, out of the darkness, really. It's a, it's a star. It's like a star to me, so hopefully I can cling on to it. And news of our work has spread around the world. We were named the world's best social enterprise in 2018, and we've won many other awards. We've also just launched our own bakery school, supporting people who are homeless with new skills. We find support and train people experiencing homelessness who have amazing abilities. All they need is the opportunity and support to become great employees. I've never known a company that would bend over backwards to um, see that their employees have everything they need and that they're happy. Homelessness is a problem that we can all solve. This is a movement, a model that goes beyond coffee and homelessness. This is the future. It takes us all to figure out how we can apply ourselves to solve the world's problems. Our model works, but we can't do this alone. We need your help to keep more people off the streets. 
We are changing the world by doing business better. And it proves that if you want to change the world, you just have to change where you buy your coffee. Um, so as you saw a couple of things of the video, uh, we've, we've now won, I think, eight Great Taste Awards, which is great. Um, obviously going to space, uh, if uh, Richard hadn't uh, gone bankrupt on that proposal, we, we would have gone. Jamal and him are, uh, are very close and he's helped us a lot to promote the brand. Um, and if you're wondering why the hell is Will I Am in this video, um, basically I actually worked with him on a competition which uh, was to discover budding social enterprises in my previous job, which was with uh, Shivers Regal Whiskey. And uh, and Change Weeks actually won it that year, and that's how I how I got to meet Jamal. So uh, that sort of gives you the context. I think the key thing to take out is, you know, we're talking about people who might be homeless, but they're not helpless. Um, and this is and and as you know, this is around employment first, um, which is super important because it's easy and it's in, it's important that we do support them when they're on the streets. But to really ratify the problem, you know, to 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 completely eliminate it, we have to give a full life intervention. Um, and this process is really important. And you may have seen the number, the figure of 82% uh, coming up. That's, uh, that's six months after they leave Change Please. So that's not when they leave Change Please. That's six months after they've got a job somewhere else. And we, we go and see how they're going. And 82% are, are doing absolutely fine and, and flying in their, in their jobs. They don't necessarily end up being baristas. They might work in um, other businesses um, as graduates. Actually, one of our one of our team just joined us uh, in our IT department. We've got a couple of people who joined our finance department. I mean, the person in the IT department was was living in a skateboard park uh, only three years ago in, Clap um, in, in Clapham. So uh, these transformations are quite incredible. Uh, and so in the process, you see that we get referred to them by different charities like Crisis or Shelter. And the reason why we do this, and we'd love you to kind of come to us and say, look, I saw someone on the street. Can, I, can, you, can you get them into change, please? The challenge with that, unfortunately, is you, we don't know what condition or what trauma they've gone through. So without that sort of almost vetting and help, um, if we then suddenly throw them into a job or public facing, they might find it traumatic and, and there might be some challenges uh, in, in, in the way they might be de dealing with consumers. So the referral and the selection process is really important, but we get them straight away on the London living wage. We find them housing. Um, and then the therapy part is really important because I keep telling people that um, this, this misconception of uh, homeless people, they just, it's all because of drugs and alcohol is just, it's just nonsense. Um, and I thought that to be honest, when I, before I started two years ago, um, and you learn very quickly, it's all from some sort of mental trauma. Um, and we've had people, you know, this person that I mentioned who lived in a skateboard park, his mother was a, a unfortunately a heroin addict and he just couldn't deal with it. And he basically left home. Um, she unfortunately passed away just, just a few months ago, but you know, th it's these things and, and you'll hear these stories over and over again. And we're actually, most of us are only three months away in terms of pay packet of facing this, this crisis. Uh, I don't want to scare anyone, but that is the reality. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. So it's all about full life intervention and then finding them ongoing employment um, through that. Look, I don't need to tell you about the numbers. You know, um, you know things are getting worse. The cost of living crisis is, 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 is real. We know there are more people on the streets. There's about 300,000 people who are actually homeless, uh, 7,000 rough sleeping in the UK, um, which is, you know, they're on the streets. To give that in perspective, by the way, in Skid Row in LA, just in one sort of block, there's 7,000 people homeless. So um, the problem's huge everywhere um, and, and it's continuing to grow. So um, I don't like doing numbers and stats specifically because I think they don't bring to life the real humans behind uh, this challenge. So here's just a story of someone and what they had to deal with. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk about him afterwards. So let me just play this if it works. So Dan, tell me about your past. I hear you've had quite a rough time there. Yeah, I mean, where we are right now, this was my bedroom. This is where I used to sleep. Just here? You slept right here? here? Right here, yes. Um, yeah, a good 10 years I slept here, so this is my 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 safe haven, basically. So Why I just, here? Because of the heat? Because of the heat, yeah. Especially yeah. when I came to London and I ended up, somehow I ended up here. Right in this very spot, I've had people try to urinate on me, I've had set fire to me, um, throw bottles at me. I think the worst though is just the loneliness, the starvation, the hunger, constant, constant hunger. We firmly believe that everyone should be allowed another go. Yeah. 
and actually sometimes you get into a position, we've all been in places where actually we're a bit stuck. Things that seem simple to a lot of people, like just talking to people across the coffee counters, can be a challenge. How has Change Please changed you? Wow, I mean, I'm still rebuilding my life, but without Change Please, how can I set kind of support? They've done more for me in a year and a half than the whole government has done in 12 and a half years. They took me off the streets, they put me into a place, they gave me clean clothes, they gave me some dignity, and I'm looking forward to getting back to becoming a chef because that's my trade. Yeah. But I would never be able to do that if I didn't have the support from Change Please, so... Maybe you should come work for me. I would love to. Maybe one day. Could you afford me, though? <laughs> <laughs> So just, that's just to give you a bit of context on, on that. And, and I always tell people that, you know, if you do see someone on the street, it's, and I know we, none of us really carry coins anymore, um, but I urge you that even you just saying, hi, uh, I'm so sorry, I don't have coins, rather than in, um, ignoring them, will make their day. Um, it's the invisible uh, part that he was talking about, that loneliness, which is probably the hardest part that they all face. So um, next time you do walk past someone just saying hello, hope you're okay, will make as much difference as giving a coin. One of the things that we were talking about the other day is how you tell stories through kind of the branding and marketing side. Could you talk a bit more about that and how it relates to, um, I don't know, social marketing and how you get those stories across to consumers? Yes, yeah, so I think the, the first sort of theory around that is... Um, for a long time, you know, we've been talking about sustainability and environmental impact, um, and that's been, you know, um, uh, obviously significantly important as, as brands, and we, we hear about terms of greenwashing and so forth. Um, and I think what's, what it's got to now is interesting because to use environmental, um, uh, you know, information or differentiation is not enough anymore. It's almost hygiene. So your consumer is now expecting you to be doing good for the environment. So when you start talking about carbon neutral or even, you know, carbon negative, they're like, I thought you should be doing that anyway. <laughs> so, um, so the world that, that sort of, um, how do you call it, that age of environmental impact, I think we've moved and now we've gone into the social revolution. So I think we've, you know, I think, and social impact is starting to fast become really important. You know, brands are being asked, what are you actually doing to the community? What are you doing for the community? Um, because, you know, you should be doing everything right for the environment. So. That's, that's, that's powerful. It's, it's challenging brands who sometimes consumers trust more than traditional institutes like the government. Um, and they're expecting, and there's a lot of following of brands. So there's a lot of pressure on brands to do good. So that's a good start. The second part is, I think, is be, being, being authentic to the impact that you're going for. Obviously, we were lucky because Changefully started with the impact at heart. Now, that doesn't mean brands that are big, and I'm going to show you an example just in a bit um, with Colgate. But I think, you know, there are, there are brands that um, that need to make sure that they're, they're they're choosing initiatives that are important to them, and and that are relevant to their product rather than just going oh that sounds like a like a popular issue let's just go with that because there are enough issues that need a lot of help, um, and so that's that's significantly important for us. Now, that's one thing. The flip side is, as much as consumers tell you yeah, yeah I'll buy a brand that's doing socially good, and I always I love research, but you have to take research with a grain of salt. People, what they say in research and what they actually do in life are completely two different things. Um, and so you, you'll get a good insight into things, but I think you also need to understand that um, they, you know, they might want to buy it. They'll say, yeah, I'll buy a change piece coffee because it, it fights homelessness. But if that coffee tastes bad or if that service at the cafe was bad, they're never coming back. And so I think it's important um, pressure point at the moment in the stories that we tell, that we tell about the social impact, but you don't end up becoming... Uh, a brand that's scaring people into buying you or or upsetting them people still want a positive positive experience so to lead into that i guess the stories that we talk about in change with if you ever go with us is all about empowerment it's all about hey not the scale of the problem yes sometimes we need to talk about the problem but most of the communication the stories that we talk about are based on the the great stories of people you know rising from from you know the lowest ebbs of life to become baristas and to move even further into other jobs. So all our stories are around positivity um, and not sort of glossing over the situation, but that's what, what people want to know. They want to know the individual stories, I think. And so what we're finding is the, the content we're creating is really about um, is really about our baristas at the center of it. Because what I need to make sure is the narrative 
and this will be a pressure point on any brand that starts from a charity and a social enterprise is you've got to get the product right still. It's still important because brands like Pret, uh, Costa, Onwards are all starting to get into social impact. So they, they're starting to do work anyway. So this is going to be a case in a couple of years where you can't differentiate the brand, just like we're doing with environmental. You can't differentiate your brand based on social impact. Everyone will be doing good. So you still need to worry about that. So I need someone, a consumer to come in, looking at all the communication going, not, I feel sorry for the homeless. So I'm going to buy this coffee today. And then I've done my little bit. I'm off. I'm going to find the next problem. It's got to be like, I love Change Please Coffee. I love what they do. Um, and they also help the homeless. And that gives you much more loyal customers. So all of our story building is around, is making sure we do that balance of we're great coffee and so forth. Um, and so we're currently in the process of a bit of a bit of a rebrand as, as I was talking to Miriam. Um, so this this is really the, the kind of the story framework that we talk about at Change Please, which is around the fact that we are an activism brand. So we're very unapologetic about fighting homelessness. Um, at every level and we want to do it now and not later like it needs to be done now the pressure is on um, and I think that's a pressure both from within us and also from people around us saying like this needs to be sorted out and 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 we do get a lot of questions about people going like well why can't the government fund this and why can't we do that and so forth and to be honest with you I can't give you I can't give you a politically correct answer um, but you know we have to do our bit whilst whilst we wait for that um, for me the humanizing brand as I talked about is we need to make sure that people realize this is not about saving people, this is about empowering people, and that these are all humans we talk about, each of them have their own story. But as I said to Miriam, I think that the key thing is it still needs to be underpinned by a quality premium coffee brand. And um, we're very, very unique proposition in that sense. But then there are other brands, I think, that I love out there. Some, uh, someone you should look at, everyone out there, or if you don't know, is Choose Love. I mean, for me, they are incredible. Um, and they're born out of more of a cause, but they have done other elements to build what is fundamentally a lifestyle brand. They use celebrity and so forth, but done in a really, really authentic way. And, and I mean, they really go out and, and do huge impact, but they're, they're worth it. Um, so we're currently doing a rebrand at the moment. And it was this, uh, to, to Miriam's point, it's this, um, we, you know, we just have, as you saw in the videos, we have sort of change and please, um, and there's no, there's no sort of logo that talks about stuff. But I thought this was like a little example to show you how storytelling fits in with what we're trying to do. Um, so what happened was uh, we're working with an agency in Peckham. The, uh, our training academy is actually in Peckham. Um, and we've been trying to explore different elements of, of, of having a logo that can tell the story very quickly. And I'm sure you've got, or you've got your favorite logo that you either wear or, or, or engage with that has a story that you love. Um, and this is just a bit of a sneak peek, peek actually. We, we haven't yet launched it. It should be in a couple of weeks. So. Um, if you hate it, please tell me because then I can stop the process and uh, try and find another logo. But basically, um, it's it's all around the fact that we discovered um, that there were street symbols and codes being used um, across different countries uh, for really a couple of hundred years um, between the communities uh, where people would leave symbols in order for other people to learn about a particular place or situation. So for example, if they went to a, to a house that gave them food, they would draw a symbol on their wall, which would mean like, you know, um, a, a generous person lives here, or there was different sort of symbols that, that happened. And they created this entire language uh, between them, which is, which is transferred across many countries. Um, and as you can see, like we basically found, you know, there's some interesting, I love the cat, which is kind woman lives here. Um, and, you know, there are, there are other symbols around the reverse P, which is this road is better than the others, but some of them are more warning stuff as well so don't go down this path or don't go into this house or well, this person's not very nice um and we found that really really interesting and there was two symbols that we we sort of well there was four that we looked at which was you know if you work you'll be given food which is the trident the, there is fruit in the garden about abundance which was interesting but the last two really got us which was a good place for a job which i think um now we're starting to see something that's happening in that community linking to what we do as change please um and the other piece being, um, you know, generous people, but don't expect too much, um, which I kind of like because the idea is we talk about this brand being not a handout brand, but a hand up brand. So people, you know, a lot of people in the streets, they don't, they don't just want things, you know, people say, oh yeah, I give them food and so forth. Um, the irony of it is like, they end up with about 20 different sandwiches that day. Um, and it's, it's not probably good for their diet or health. They just want an opportunity to come back in. And a lot of them, a lot of them want to do that. 
Um, and so the, we decided in the last two symbols um, being a very interesting way to go about it. And we actually combined it to, to create really a logo um, where you've kind of got the C that's been made from the diamond and the P that's made from the swirl um, and started to sort of articulate um, almost to the very essence of our brand, what we do stand about and stand for. And then, you know, you can start seeing the sort of the, 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 the pattern work trying to appear um, and starting to see how this branding could, could work. And we didn't, I think what makes it interesting for consumers is you want to tell them stories, but you don't want to shove it down their throat. Uh, consumers love kind of going, well, why is that logo so weird? <laughs> you know, why is it not just a standard CP? Um, and then you kind of go, actually, I might look into that, or we might have other touch points such as a website or social that should start telling you the story about why that is. Um, and then, you know, we were talking about even uh, Miriam and I were saying that we are going to launch these cups where the baristas will give you the cup, but they'll actually cross out the pleas um, when they hand it to you in order to start a discussion about how we need change now as opposed to a softer change, please. And so simple little things to tell stories um, through action rather than always um, just verbalizing it can make such a huge difference. Uh, and, and you can and you kind of go, yeah, that's true, actually. Like this problem is severe. Um, and, it, you know, and we want, and the, problem, the other thing with the challenge with homelessness is it's not a Christmas thing. I think the problem is a lot of people think, oh, it's winter, um, let's donate now and forget that it's 365 days a year. It's, 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 it keeps going. They don't suddenly disappear. They're not all fine into their houses. They are there on the streets every single day. So um, it's, it's very keen on that. And then we decided, you know, with those symbols, we can start doing merchandise. Um, we can, you know, we can start doing environmentally friendly stickers if, if they ever invent those. Uh, I know it's an example, but, you know, um, you know, there's key things. But you kind of start seeing how we start doing the product and doing some work around it. Um, we even thought about putting some statements up and, and, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, kind of building it. So it's kind of early days at the moment on this, but just wanted to show you how, rather than showing you a video, which, which I kind of will about partnership, but that all touch points can tell a story. Uh, and we feel like we're heading in the right direction here. So, um, so that's, that's an example. Based on that, so do you think that all companies need to have some kind of social impact or at least marketing that alludes to the fact that, yes, they are aware and care? I think, I think you're going to be, I think every brand will have that. And the reason for that is the employees. Because people, you know, they are putting pressure on each of their companies to do some good. Now, that can be something as a basic CSR initiative, which is one day a year, to actually pushing their, their, their companies. So the internal pressure is actually um, bigger. Um, you know, the reason why we, we, we were so lucky to get great talent, I'm not saying about myself, but right, everyone else apart from me, that at very, you know, like they come to change because they want to do good. Um, and so, you know, with that comes comes other things that because, you know, 100% of our profits do go, go towards the cause, for example. So I think the employee pressure is, is big. Um, and then I think the, the thing is, there's so many problems in the world that I think it's unfair to suddenly go to a, about a bank who gets involved if they do it properly. Like we do work with HSBC. They, you know, they, they were the ones to give no, uh, no fixed address banking accounts. So who's going to benefit from that? It's a lot of the people we work with. So if there's, if there's authentic products within there, then you should try and do that good. And you don't have to put, I think the irony is, I think I saw an ad with, um, I'm not going to name the, the beer, but they, they were like, oh, we're putting 150,000 um, towards um, cleaning up the oceans. But the ad looked like they'd spent about 350,000 on producing the ad and then probably added it a lot more on media. Media is fine because media gives you the noise. I, I always, people always go, I can't believe they spent, you know, a couple of million on media. The reality is like that is giving as much um, awareness that that campaign couldn't have got. So I'd never criticize that, but I do criticize high production, um, you know, ads to talk about whether they're giving more money. So you've just got to be careful on that. But I think we are heading towards, like I said, the social revolution in marketing. It's, it's already happening and you're already seeing brands uh, doing incredibly well. That doesn't mean existing brands can't play in that space. Um, and also the, you know, yes. And also the, the, the irony is the more, the more product they're selling, the more money they're going to be able to put towards CSR campaigns or BSR campaigns. So it's fine. Like we can be a bit cynical about it, but they, they need to sell the product in order to keep people, their shareholders happy, but also at the same time, if it means they can do good, why, why stop it? Just, you know, it doesn't matter what percentages they're allocating. That help couldn't have been there last year. So 
um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, that, that kind of leads into what you very kindly talk to our students about with brand activism and so forth. And you always say that making money goes hand in hand with kind of the activism of, of a brand, whatever it is. Do you, can you say any more about that? Because you, you speak very eloquently to our students. I'm trying to remember what I, um, but I, think it's, <laughs> I think it's all around that profit and purpose, you know, because people always talk about, um, you know, it's purpose over, purpose over profit. Uh, and then people, they're, they're the cynics who might say, no, it's profit over purpose. Actually, it's, it's the mentality of both that works together that is, is powerful. And you can, you can, if you look at purpose, the reason why profit's important with purpose is it, it when, purpose, when profit's involved in a purpose-based organization, what it does is it starts to get you think entrepreneurially. So what it does mean is that a lot of people who work in purpose-led organizations rightfully have a very strong passion about that purpose. But what they forget is it's still a competition in terms of getting awareness, you know, in terms of getting um, your share of voice. So only through profit, or even that mentality of having to try and make profit, can you entrepreneurially think about, okay, who is our consumer target? Like, how do we engage them? How can we help drive more donations? How can we drive more product maybe and things like that? So they have, you, when you're purpose built, you need profit to drive that. On the flip side, if you're a profit organization, purpose is what's gonna take your brand to the next level because that's what's being accept, expected by your consumer, by your internal, um, internal stakeholders. And so you need to start thinking about, right, this is really important. This is not a tick box exercise anymore. It's not about, oh, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we make sure the goals are, the goals are, you know, um, are ticked off. It's about legitimately building a strong brand. And I, and I find that quite exciting because um, brands do have communities, you know, they, they have stronger communities than, than most. And, it, and your community is dying to get involved two way or even actually have an aggressive say in your brand. So um, I think they work hand in hand, profit and purpose. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And um, we see that more and more. I think these are terms that you have brought up for boycotting and boycotting. Yes. And I know that people of my generation, when I speak to students, in fact, they always say, oh, yeah, there's some there's some companies they won't purchase from because yes. of their social, you know, the links to social issues they do or don't agree with. So do you think companies need to actively take a stand on not necessarily all hot button topics, but some of them and just be aware that it's gonna, you're gonna lose some audience and gain others. I mean, a big famous, a big American beer brand comes to mind for their stuff in the past couple of months. Uh, yeah, no, I know. Uh, and I think I think that's the thing, you know, because the, 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 there are the big, big challenges when it comes to sort of climate or, um, or rights. Um, and I think it's an interesting question because I personally think that we need to put more onus on much more fragmented challenges out there in society that that could deal with do with that help, I think, you know, and sometimes um, it's and I think when we do the class, we, we look at people who've tried to, to jump on bandwagons. I think, um, you know, Black Lives Matter was an interesting one when, you know, um, a lot of brands thought if they just put a black square on their grid, then, you know, they, they, they sort of wash their hands off it. So. If you're going to go in there, do it properly, um, and I think do it at every level. You know how you how you because a lot of brands that said, oh yeah, no, this is not right. You know, Black Lives Matters. Then you looked at their diversity policy in their business or their or their um, you know even that level, um, and you're just going, hang on, this. I mean, what, what do you mean? You know, so so I think it's fine to go and talk about it, but make sure you're doing something about it at every level. Um, to and it's not just a, a tick box exercise. Yeah, Pride is one of those events where it's just. <laughs> do you have you seen the comedian Cecily Buttershop ad? It's uh, great. It's I like for this month we are gay. Oh uh, right, okay. That sort of thing. <laughs> so you see, you see it happening around different events and times of the year, and I guess that is because they want to tap into a lot of different markets, and some of them do do it really well. Can you think of any companies that are doing this kind of socially conscious marketing really well? Yeah, I think authentically. Just, yeah, I think just on the pride thing, it's a, it's an interesting one, right? Because uh, I used, as I worked in alcohol before, one of our brands was Absolute, who, who and a lot of vodka companies did early on jump on, on, on that. And then we see some work on that. The thing with pride is there's a, there's, it depends what country you're, coming from because I think even if Adidas did something around pride which they do 
um, you know, they do a collection. But if it's if it's somewhere in Asia or if it's somewhere in Africa, like where maybe that that needs a bit more um, push to understand to make people understand and get, get the young generation to appreciate, then I'm all for that. So I think I think each to their own, each country to their own. Where I think sometimes you do know they're jumping on a bandwagon, which is which is awful. So that that's more on the the, the uh, pride as an example. I think uh, mm. is an interesting one. Um, for me, some of the brands that I've I've got a, it's it's kind of coming across as um, there are brands I think that have that are definitely started in some way. I mean, for me, Tony's Chocolate Only will always be the brand mentor. <laughs> Sorry, Hannah, I can see you. <laughs> um, but basically, Tony's for me um, are quite incredible. And for people who don't know about Tony's, um, you definitely should go to your corner shop and, and grab one. Um, but they are all about uh, zero zero um, slavery um, in, in the cacao industry. It's a massive problem that we, we seem to... Uh, we seem to, um, to so the, this was brilliant. I don't know if anyone's aware of this one that they did, which was a couple of years ago, but they basically called out all the other big players that they weren't doing enough to lobby against um, the slavery practices uh, of the cacao industry. So what Tony's did was they actually launched um, products which looked uh, very close to their competitors. Um, and Sainsbury's were about to go and put it on, uh, put it on their shelves. Uh, before um, these so-called competitors threatened Sainsbury's and said, if you do that, we're pulling our stock. But Tony's were never looking at this as a sales driver. They, they exactly achieved what they wanted, which was PR, uh, and, and got, got, you know, got these brands exposed. Um, and you could still buy these kits. I think if you can get hold of them now, they're probably worth, worth a bit of money. But um, you know, I think for me, they're, they're, they're an incredible brand uh, in that sense. Um, and, you know, and it's interesting because they're also quite an, I think I, what I love about them is their open authenticity. It's about trying to address the fact that, yeah, they know there's a problem with sugar and, and eating too much. And so this is a serious moderation campaign that they were doing. Um, and again, calling out the industry. I think this is one of the things is how do you cleverly call out the industry to do something about uh, about these challenges? And I think for me, they're, they're an excellent brand. Um, the other ones that I saw, so... Um, I did talk about Absolute before, but but it addresses, um, you know, when you talk about an alcohol company and you're like, well, um, you know, how can alcohol talk about um, non-consexual sex? Um, Absolute did it brilliantly um, to call this out. And then to actually, to your point, Miriam, how do you also put where your money, where your mouth is? And so they basically, um, through uh, social campaigns, you know, for every like or share, Absolute will donate money to different charities uh, in the US and also put their own money in to, to do this. So I'm just going to show you this video because I think it's an interesting one. I think to your point, this that was an interesting one because when you said, "Oh, it should be an absolute is a big brand," let's let's not um, deny that. But I think it shows you how important the story is through all the layers. You know, you Anne, who's an incredible um, CEO, and she still is there at the moment in North America. You know, she had, she did go through. Um, she kind of it's a very lightly put there, but the the, the depth of that story is, is horrible. Um, and then you know we've got all these other elements to it. So I think to your question about should big brands do something in the world, I think you need to look at all the layers with, within that, um, which is which is um, which is interesting. And then I think the one that um, you know, look, I, we can talk about. I, I, I don't want to. I didn't want to talk about sort of the not in a bad way, but the Patagonias of the world and so forth. We know we we all know uh, the brands out there that we that 
are regularly doing good and so forth. Yeah, so the Colgate one is a really interesting one because uh, uh, for many people who don't know, um, people, you know, 40% of people who are rough sleeping on the streets uh, do have massive dental problems. Um, and I think that's from diet and it's also just, you know, not being able to look after it and so forth. 17% um, of them pull out their own teeth because of the pain. So, you know, which is just horrible. Um, and so when we were looking into that, but change, please, as you can imagine, and I don't want to be, um, don't want to sort of dumb it down, but if you said homelessness was one to 10, one might be someone who couch surfs at your house and never really has a house. They're kind of moving around. Um, uh, eight is pretty much they've just got on the streets. Nine, 10 other people that you really, it, it might be very hard to get them back because they, I think they've just gone down such a massive, a massive hole. Someone like Adam that, Adam that you saw on the video before um, was great because we managed to get him back, even though he stayed quite a long time. He stayed on the streets for over 10 years. Um, by the way, he was actually an amazing chef, worked in New York, uh, came to London, um, and one night lost his wife and son in a car accident. Three months later, he was in London Bridge. So, um, and, you know, and interestingly, the chef who was interviewing him, he ended up getting a job with, with the chef on, the, on that interview, which is, which is incredible. Um, so you've got that, that nine and 10, we do need to still help, you know, and, and as much as we, we, we kind of not necessarily contributing to the problem by giving them immediate solutions, the reality is they're stuck there. So we need to do the help. So we did this initiative with Colgate and we have another bus with HSPC. But the Colgate bus is um, pretty much taking those vital solutions uh, to, to, the, um, to the, those on the streets. Now, this is actually all in the bus. So... We have counselling, we have showers, we've got bathroom, we've got laundromat, we've got a hairdresser, and really importantly on the bottom, uh, bottom right there, we actually have a full-on full dental clinic um, that was funded by, uh, by Colgate and, and, and another partner. And this bus goes to Hackney, Dalston, it's going to Croydon now, it's going into the city, and we have um, people coming through the buses. Uh, we're aiming to at least take about 1,000 people through these buses. Um, now, we do get, obviously, a lot of rough sleepers, but at the same time, we'll get people who've just been kicked out of home, who've been evicted, who'll come to the buses. We've, as of last month, um, sorry, no, um, last month, we discovered two people off the streets who had mouth cancer, who we managed to get straight away to the hospital, where the lady who came in, who pulled 10 of her own teeth out. Um, and so you can imagine these services are quite quite important. Now, the, the great thing is Colgate have done now... Um, to your question again, Miriam, about is this just a branding exercise for Colgate? Well, no, they, they funded the dental clinic. They give us all the products. But on top of that, they've now got a full dental nurse and dentist program who will come to volunteer every week on the bus. So they're running all that for us. They're also doing an internal volunteering program for staff to come on the bus just to do some of the other activity like registering, um, maybe talking like the counselling, um, helping on that sort of stuff, um, part of it. They also did a video, which I'm going to show you, um, even though it looks uh, slick, it wasn't. We, we made sure that I think it cost about 50K to do this video. And then they put a lot of media. So we've been in cinemas, we've been on Channel 4. Um, so it's really given us a lot of, lot of um, amplification and also the, the good that they're doing. So I'm just going to show you that video with, um, with Raf on it. And now Channel 4 and Colgate presents an initiative helping people experiencing homelessness. With social enterprise, change please. This is where you slept? Yeah, it's mad to think. At times, that was my home. And how old were you at the time? 17. Still practically a kid? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't good at home, you know, it just wasn't a safe environment. What happened next for you? Met with Change Please, trained me up to be a barista. They boosted my self-esteem, helped me get back on my feet. I was off the rails. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for Change Please. So what was your health like when you were sleeping here, when you, when you was homeless? Yeah, it wasn't too good, man. One of the things that was really hurting me was my teeth. At uh, one point, I got tooth infection. It's really tough getting a dentist when you're homeless. Tell me a bit about this bus. So it's a partnership between Colgate and Change Please, and they offer dental services to people that are homeless. It's a small step that's going to help us all smile again. <laughs> That came out of Jamal's um, Jamal's head. Our founder comes up with um, incredible ideas. Uh, just so you know, we're uh, we're basically looking at a cruise ship, 
um, that he wants to to buy. For sure, yeah, that's good. And convert that. So that's his next thing, uh, which we're we're trying to work on. But um, uh, yeah, hopefully that gives. I know we need some time for questions, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a. Um, yeah, no, that's really good. I'm gonna not ask any more questions. Um, let's see, we do have a couple in the chat. The first one is, when are you planning on expanding outside of London to places in the UK? I think the eye is on university cities like Oxford, Cambridge, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, those would be good as well. Yeah, so um, we we definitely are. So the, the way we really start is um, make sure we have a training academy in the city. So as I, as I said, we've got one in Peckham and we've also started one in Regent's Place. Um, in that way, we can start training people to become uh, baristas and then find them locations to work in. So there's discussions now on training academies in Oxford, uh, Manchester, Glasgow, and Leeds, I believe. Um, and so that will be the starting point. We're already in different universities and so forth. And I know someone in Oxford has um, said that they'd give us money to open up a cafe there as well. Um, so there's there's still you know um, there's still that 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 opportunity working there, and then globally, as I said, we're now launched in the US, France, Japan this year, Australia this year, um, uh, in Ireland, um, Germany. So it's there's, there's a lot going on at the moment. Good. So I'm looking forward to that in a few months. Okay, um, a year just, or so longer. I, I just saw a comment from Hannah come up, and I think it's a really valid point because. We are finding there's a lot of space, so it's not even just in Oxford, but also in London. And we've been really benefiting from that because a lot of landlords um, are being, um, are not necessarily under pressure, but they realize, yes, we talk about the ESGs, um, but I think the the reality is that's allowing us to get rent-free spaces. It's allowing us to, um, for them to pay for fit outs and to do good. So we, we've been quite interest, interested in that. And also a lot of hotels have closed down. So trying to find accommodation and so forth will be great for them as well. Hmm. Yeah, that might be, that'll be something to look into. But Hannah also has a question up near the top of the chat that uh, wants to know if you have any advice for freelancers who want to incorporate social purpose into their businesses. Um, in terms of do donating time or in terms of? Uh, Hannah, if you want to. Yeah, I was just, um, more so the things you spoke about are kind of more grand scale. Um, and I'd like to make a difference, but I can't necessarily say I'm going to give all my profits for instance because I I need to pay my bills and I need to live and stuff like that yes. so I just I wondered a what does it mean when you say I'm giving all my profits because I'd love to give a portion of but yes, yes. You know, what 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 is my costs and what is what is the extra um and are there different ways that I can do it that doesn't just say I, I'll give my profits for instance um how can I do it as a freelancer yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And I think, you know, and we, we give 100% of our profits because I guess we started from a charity. But then if you look at big businesses, they probably have X percentage of their profits that will go towards that. I think the other, the other thing that we, we, we all have is time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, we do have a lot of people. Hey, you're more than happy, I'm more than happy for you to come and help us at um, a change, please. But um, you get to Oxford up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so basically, you know, there's time in terms of we do get a lot of, um, pro bono services. Um, I think the, I think it's interesting, and I'm not saying it because it's free work. I think there should be always a value exchange. Mm -hmm. But you know, we do have um, pro bono designers or agencies that work for us because it also helps to build their um, portfolio to a certain extent. Um, I'm not sure, Hannah, specifically what skill set you were referring to, but I think that donation of time, mm -hmm. um, and and we do make sure that we return. There is a value exchange. Everyone wins wins on that. So I think it's whatever you think you can you can provide. That's super interesting. Where would you find those? Um, you know, is there like a database of, of freelancers that say, I want to be able to give my time? I do um, I do a lot of content creation, um, like strategy and marketing for creative companies. Um, I'm all about try trying to give a bit more to the city centre because so much of it is is university based in Oxford and, and it's, yes. a bit, it's a bit bleak for the locals, if I'm totally honest. Um, so I want to be able to give time but yeah where, where would you find this how do i communicate there is there is a database um uh leave it with me i'll i'll email i'll email to me there is one and i just can't think of the top of my head there is there is one yeah, thank you yeah, no, no, but that's good thank you yeah i'll pass that on to the powers that be so a couple other questions down here at the bottom daniela wants to know if you could tell us a bit more about your training program and have you thought about maybe having partnerships with institutions like universities 
Yeah, it's a great question. And this is this is where um, we've, because we have an impact team that we've just built. And so there's, and they specialize in um, working with referral partners, bringing people in, training them as baristas, and then finding them ongoing employment. And so a lot of the partners we're now working with, part of the thing is, yes, can we sell our coffee and can we get our baristas to train there? But also can we get them placements um, working there as well? So. Um, it's almost a requirement now for all the partners moving forward that they try and integrate um, further training or even training at a different discipline uh, within that. Um, so that is that is part of the, the program at the moment. We're also starting a program called Change Please in Residence, which is, um, you know, approaching restaurants or cafes that might need help and that we can place our, our trainees there because a lot of the trainees don't always want to be lifelong baristas. The reason why we do barist baristas initially is the fact that it's such a safe place, the cafe. Um, and so, sorry, just got a bit loud here. Um, it's a safe place, the cafe. Like people go, why not at a bar? Why not at a, why can't they be in stadiums? But, you know, um, once people have their coffee, they're not as grumpy. And it's just a lovely environment for them to learn about self-esteem, um, you know, life skills and so forth. That's why we start with baristas, but you're absolutely right with the idea is now to try and, to try and build them uh, through that. Um, and vice versa, we are looking at, you know, there's, as we're from Peckham, you know, um, originally that we do find a lot of, um, uh, d d you know, to your point, Hannah, that like design kids who, who wouldn't even know where to start. Like they wouldn't even know where to go to Google to, to look for. They don't know, you know, there's no point putting an ad in LinkedIn. Um, but there's some great agencies that will go through like Xbox forums or PlayStation forums and go like, hey, we're looking for young, you know, like young designers. And there's so many incredible talent um, who come from a lower socioeconomic background who are probably being told by their parents, not in a bad way, get a real job um, because we need money now and and probably aren't being encouraged or to flourish in what their creative aspects are. So there, there are ways in that we're trying to, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's kind of, um, it's definitely. Yeah, I, think, I think so. It kind of links to the next question, which is about, um, it's from E, which is short for something, but says he's on the careers he is part of careers at oxford brooks and a lot of students are definitely thinking more ethically we see that in our classrooms as well and would be very interested in change please and the stuff you're doing and he wants to know if change please offers work for students grads or ways they can get more uh, involved um we again that's that's probably part of the program moving forward in that so um we are quite a lean team at the moment. And the incredible thing about this business I tell, um, and I just think we got ease, it's, I think it's you and, um, so, um, you know, I think we will look to do that program, particularly on the marketing side, trying to get people the opportunity to, to come and help. The, the challenge is when it's, when it's hard volunteer work because um, there's, an, there's an onus on us and compliance when, when it comes to volunteering on the streets or, or, or work like that, which probably crisis or someone like that is better set up to do. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of skill sets that we need to come back in the business to help us from the marketing and the promotion or uh, from a coffee point of view, that, that would be always important. So we don't have a set program, but we want to do something. I think that was a, a nod to keep us in mind. Yeah, when absolutely. Thinking about I know, that. I know, absolutely. <laughs> so I will drag you back to Oxford. It's like a hiring, it's like a hiring uh, call, this one. I feel like I've, I've got like I think, a double the team. I think you're in a good position that you're doing something really interesting and cool and helpful that is also like, as you say, good for us and everyone. So good coffee for us, training for others, money for the company. You know, I can go on and on, but. It's a good point um, to those who maybe want to build a brand one day around social impact or want to do good. The reason why Change Please attracted me uh, um, a huge way was the fact that I do believe in order to make change, you need to make change easy for the consumer. So I think it gets tricky when you, and, and I know it's important to go like, can you sign on this website and do this petition? Or can you, you know, donate this money and I'm not sure where it's going to go and so forth. I think for me, what won me over was, was we just asking you to change your cup of coffee. And if we can give you as good a quality coffee or better, and you can change your life, like th that action is so simple. And as you know, the attention economy is still waning. And um, and I think, you know, we, and even when we do donations, we, we tested some things out where rather than going, oh, can you give us money? We said for 25 pounds, you will get someone off the, on the, off the streets and get a day's barista training. That took up, that had way more take up. 
because people are like, okay, I get this transaction right now. It's very simple. I give 25 and someone gets a training for a day um, as opposed to maybe a bit more esoteric um, transactions where people go, I, I don't really quite know where anything is going. So it's really important, I think, um, uh, to have that to have that etched in. So Maya wants to know, um, about the way change happens, how important is legislation or does it lag behind? It's a very well, big question. Yeah, and I think, I, think, I think we're a perfect example of the fact that we can only do what we can do. Um, the legislation around homelessness is, is horribly slow. Um, and I think there's, and then I, I think that's why I do love someone like Tony's who, who actively then went and lobbied and, you know, and took, it, took it to there. There's a discussion at the moment about how far we go as, as change, please. Um, but also it's around collaboration. I think we're talking about, do we work together with the crisis shelters and other brands out there? Redemption is another one that I want to mention, another coffee brand that um, takes up um, ex-prisoners um, to work in their cafes. So I think collaboratively we can do something and the, and the change is immediate. So, you know, we, we, sometimes we can't, it's small steps, right? You either pick, you know, you, you, you can pick the battles and, and do some good, um, but unfortunately, legislation and the slow moving machine is exactly why brands are under pressure to, to do some things. So I wish I had a more positive answer, Maya, on that. But I think we just need to do what we can do. Um, and we're already seeing that results, you know, like we've taken 500 people um, off the streets and become baristas. We're going to have 1,000 people come on the buses and hopefully we'll discover people that need help or may even end up being baristas. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's the best we can do. Well, there's precedent in Oxford for the kind of socially motivated coffee companies. There's one in Peddington, which is pretty oh, yes. good. Um, what was I going to say? There's also a book about how, it was exactly that question. It's a couple of years old now, but it's about how um, enterprising individuals and companies are stepping into the place of government and mm. doing, like pushing forward social change because they can move much more quickly and yeah. see things on the ground and do something about it. I can't remember the name of it, but... So I'm not very useful there. Ari and I are like, I don't know, we'll get it, we'll find it. Is it is it by Miriam Johnson? Is, are you uh, plugging not your book? Yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a um, no, I think we have time for maybe one more question if anyone has any. And then we will thank Ari for his time and expertise. Could, could I just ask him? I was wondering now that you um, mentioned the attention economy and also um reacting responding quite quickly to certain waves and attention on on certain issues but the flip side of it might be how easily that ebbs away and i was just thinking of black lives matter as an example where there was a lot of attention for for a very limited time and where where change in legislation and so on is is not even a question because the the attention just not that it went away completely but you could see how it peaked and then very quickly yes um yeah no and, and i think you're right because it became such a it was incredible wasn't it it, it you know and, and now we're still talking about police brutality and we're still talking about racism and football and we're talking about every other element of it um and and that is the challenge i think that those sort of um bigger levels of, of protest it almost became a bit of a fad unfortunately it, it became almost a, a sort of a lifestyle thing to to have as a, as a badge that you were supporting it and so forth. And I think that's the risk, you know, everything needs slow, authentic, not slow, sorry, but more credible, authentic ways of action and, and, and acts of, of, of do, making a difference. I think that's the only way you can legitimately, you know, change please even it's been around for six, seven years now. We're starting to really find all that sort of um, coming together. So I do think that's a concern when there's something like that, that happens and it, and it just, um, I think you're absolutely right. It got the attention, but where was the action? It hasn't changed. It has changed some stuff. And let's face it, underlying there's, there's huge things in there. So that's the catch. I think whatever you do, you just need to, you know, if there's something that's close to your heart and you do it properly um, and you do it with with action rather than words or just um, as a badge, I think you'll, you'll gain much more things quicker. It's a valid point. Sad. <clears throat> on that on that cherry note um <laughs> like us to wrap up and thank you very much Ari, for your time and thank you to uh siren daniela maya hannah etc for organizing this and giving us the space to talk about all of these issues and hear from an expert and thank you all very much